I'm Toby Jurovics, Curator of Photography at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and I'd like to welcome you to our presentation of Accommodating Nature, the photographs of Frank Golke. Through the exhibition, we traced Mr. Golke's work for almost 35 years. Mr. Golke's photographs are spare and elegant. They speak quietly, and yet they also speak with great affection for the American landscape. Traveling from his hometown of Wichita Falls, Texas, to Minneapolis, across the High Plains, the volcanic landscapes of Mount St. Helens, the Sudbury River in Massachusetts, and far beyond. Frank Olke captures a landscape that is often unruly and sometimes destructive. Throughout the exhibition, we see a constant theme of tension and affection for the landscapes that surround us. Frank Olke's photographs touch on the most complicated themes of American photography from the past 30 years. He finds a landscape that is not pristine, yet one that is also not beyond our reach. He shows us how we can find a home in the places that surround us. Accommodating Nature, the photographs of Frank Golke, was organized by the Eamon Carter Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. It's on view at the Smithsonian American Art Museum from December 5, 2008 through March 3, 2009. The following is an interview with Frank Olke done in Fort Worth, Texas on the occasion of the exhibition. Why do I make photographs? I think when um, my patience with English literature as an academic study ran out, uh, photography just felt like the best thing I'd ever done. I just liked it. I liked the whole process, the walking around with a camera uh, without any purpose in mind except to respond and uh, going into the dark room and doing all that magic stuff. It was just a very congenial kind of activity and it made me feel as if I were doing something important. I don't know why, but it just felt like me and it felt important. If you're going to take the landscape as your subject, um, you've really got to know what has come before and what the assumptions on which it was based are and um, um, make choices about it. You know, what do I use and what do I discard uh, from the past? I mean, I think that's what any artist does. The landscape work that was being done by a lot of people who were influenced by Adams and Weston and, and Minor White and Caponegro. Um, it just seemed really dead to me. I mean, all the conviction had gone out of it. It was just, they weren't responding to the world anymore. They were responding to an ideal of photographic um, excellence that um, came purely from other photographs. By the late 60s and early 70s, uh, I, you know, a lot of people couldn't ignore anymore what was happening to um, the places they grew up in. Uh, they were changing toward greater and greater uniformity. You can't ignore the problem of increasingly unindividuated scenes and trying to assert some kind of um, human distinctions within it. So there was that um, continual tug, which is one of the things that makes photography so much fun and so interesting between the world you'd like to see and the world you have to look at. Why would you take a photograph of that house? I grew up in a town where there were lots of houses like that. So it was a kind of 
nostalgia tinged um, exercise. And also because visually uh, it does one of those things that uh, architecture traditionally has done, which is to affirm an order different from the order of nature, which makes us feel as though we have some control over um, how the world looks. What's fascinating in that picture, to me, you know, just the individual touches that make it different from every other house on that street. And just something about the, the dissonance between the kind of grand claims of those trees, which seem as if they should be flanking some kind of, um, you know, classical temple, and the modesty of the house whose presence it's announcing. I used to describe it in all kinds of whimsical ways, like uh, um, the exhaust from a vegetable rocket. I like being required to pay attention. An example of that would be my dissatisfaction with the kinds of reports that I read in the mass media about Mount St. Helens made me want to go out and see for myself. You know, I knew that wasn't um, a story that came anywhere near the complexity of, of the event. So, in part, it was a kind of corrective. And I suppose in, in some way, um, there has been that admonitory aspect. Don't forget about this. Look at this. This is not as simple as you think it is. Life's inherently messy. Nature is utterly indifferent to our notions of order, and yet we keep trying um, to make things as orderly and predictable as we can, and ultimately each one of us fails. Sometimes that failure is comic, and sometimes it's tragic, and sometimes it's neither one, it's just a fact. And I think part of what one tries to do as a person who makes images, however you make them, is to make that image pull as much of the viewer's total experience, conscious and unconscious, learned and instinctive, as possible to create these um, semblances of life.